Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 74 of our Libraries and Response series. It began three years ago at the dawn of the pandemic, uh, about which there was no debate. It was absolutely uh, a crisis uh, that took the world by storm. It, it, if you can recall, everything changed. I mean, civilization just turned on a dime because of this thing, because of the, the, the suspected lethality and, uh, uh, and, and communication of this, this virus. So we've settled down. We've, a lot of us have been infected. A lot of us have been vaccinated and so forth, but it goes on. Uh, it continues to mutate. Hopefully it will continue to be less lethal than it, or, or, or as uh, uh, deadly as it was early on. But there are still many, many people that are suffering from these long COVID phenomena, which is just horrible, disabling kind of thing. So this is not over. Um, even though it goes on, what we learned during 2020 was that there were, uh, it, it was almost like a cascade of crises that were just coming one after another. It was, uh, uh, there was, of course, an economic crisis when everything shut down. <clears throat> Then there were social crises, uh, uh, the murder of George Floyd, uh, uh, political crises, and, and then of course the <clears throat> the granddaddy of crises, the climate disaster, uh, which looms over everything and actually shrinks everything uh, by comparison. Uh, it's one of been our uh, topics of focus is how libraries uh, serve in response to uh, uh, extreme weather events, which are increasing in frequency and severity, and they're happening everywhere. Uh, if you're just reading the paper, you're seeing about these incredible heat phenomena in India and China. <clears throat> That's this is their season for the for extra heat uh, in the U.S. We've got our summer coming up. We're just gonna have to see the 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 global systems have shifted from this La Nina, relatively mild, to El Nino, a, more, uh, a warmer uh, circulation of air and ocean currents. So we're in for a rough ride. Uh, I'm sorry to have to tell you, but uh, the good news is that we have uh, our libraries to rally around and be community hubs for various kinds of response. One of those, of course, is, is uh, communication information technologies. So today we are going to talk about um, the adoption barriers uh, to uh, participating in the uh, global digital society, uh, which we've uh, articulated as availability, affordability, and usability. We'll get to that. Uh, my name is Don Means. I'm the director of the Gigabit Libraries Network. We're an open collaboration of innovation libraries doing all kinds of interesting things with various uh, mostly information technologies, information communication technologies. Uh, our sessions uh, today, and as every session before, are hosted and recorded by the uh, International Federation of Library uh, Associations and Institutions uh, at the controls of Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA, uh, based in the Netherlands. Uh, our series sponsor is the Internet Society, whose... Uh, uh, web address we have correctly listed today. Thank you, Internet Society, for helping us do these. This is, this is part of our Broadband from Space series where we look at these uh, technologies, excuse me, uh, that have emerged to make some really interesting possibilities. Satellites and, and broadband uh, from space, from satellites is, is not new, but what is new uh, are satellites at uh, near near orbits. Touch on that in a second. But these are the these are the kind of obvious applications for broadband that uh, that these uh, these new technologies have a uh, uh, a particular capability to address. So this is the. Closest I could find to a scale on uh, these various uh, satellite orbits 
Uh, geostationary is the one that we've had for a long time. This was, a, this was an invention or a conception by Arthur C. Clarke, the famous science fiction writer. Years ago, he talked about the, the, the prospect. He'd figured out that we could uh, launch satellites and put them at a distance from the Earth that uh, they would uh, orbit at the same rate that the, that the, that the Earth rotates. Uh, but to do that, they had to be roughly three times the diameter of the Earth out, uh, some 23,000 miles or something, 35,000 kilometers, something like that. So that allows uh, total coverage of the planet with only three satellites. Uh, you can kind of see the coverage zone, which is why this, uh, we chose this graphic. Uh, three, three devices can, can provide coverage to just about everywhere. It gets really difficult at the poles because of the angle, but most people certainly live in that. The, the MEO, the medium orbit, is a kind of a hybrid between low Earth orbit and geostationary. So it has not as much coverage area, but it's still farther out. And that distance out translates into delay of the signal. Uh, the speed of light apparently is not fast enough for uh, instant communications. It has to go out and come back. And that can that lag can interrupt uh, certain <clears throat> kinds of real-time communication needs. But for a lot of what we do, uh, the the lag is not not really important. Uh, what we're doing right now might be uh, might be more difficult in in real interactive time. But uh, downloading videos or doing mail and loading websites is no problem. The low Earth orbit satellites, which are new and and something we've talked about before and will again, are uh, at roughly a thousand kilometers it ranges a bit but it, it's close much closer to the earth and that allows the signal time to be very very quick the, the the lag or latency measured in milliseconds is somewhere around 40 milliseconds which is pretty much uh undetectable to most of us and allows all kinds of uh, normal things that we do with uh, terrestrial uh, infrastructure uh, however, uh, the, it appears that the uh, satellite is stationary in this image, but it's not. You have to, because it's so close, you need, uh, they have to be moving to, to stay up. And it requires thousands of these uh, satellites to provide uh, the same kind of coverage you get from geostationary orbit. Well, that seems to be happening. The first of those, of course, is Starlink, but there are others that are, that are, uh, uh, starting to come online, OneWeb, and uh, there, there are a handful of these uh, plans that are in some stage of deployment or uh, planning. So we're excited to have more of those out there. This is important to us because <clears throat> the prospect for using satellite communications, and we'll hear a little bit about it today from, from our speaker, uh, they don't rely on uh, the terrestrial infrastructure. I mean, finally they do. You have to be connected to a, a fiber line somewhere to, to connect to the global internet. But the, the so-called last mile, uh, you don't. This, the, the satellites go from uh, a backbone connection somewhere to pretty much anywhere. And that's the exciting part because the, the terrestrial networks are expensive and slow and the infrastructure economics say that the farther away you are from the core of any network, this could be water, electricity, whatever, that the more expensive it is to deliver services. That's kind of commonsensical. And also the farther away you get from the core of uh, the networks, the built networks, you find there are fewer people. And the people you do find, they tend to have less money. So all of these conspire against uh, deployment of these systems because they are expensive and the, the, most of the providers that are deploying them are expecting returns on their investment. So they tend to wire the dense urban markets where there are more people, it's cheaper to provide, and they have more money. So that's been the dilemma. And that's part, uh, may, that's probably the biggest reason we've got 3 billion something people still unconnected. We're gonna hear what uh, our, our guest has to say about that here shortly. Uh, Ryan Palmer is with us. 
to talk about Microsoft's uh, strategy, various strategy, I would say, to address these barriers. We'll get right to you, uh, Ryan. I want to uh, talk a little bit about these barriers. And this is just our sort of arbitrary taxonomy for describing these uh, availability. So if it's not available, you know, the, the question of affordability and usability are, are moot, right? I mean, not available, it doesn't matter what it costs uh, or what it can do, it's just not. If it is, then it becomes the question of, well, can you afford it? Well, I don't know. It's, you know, it depends on how much it costs and how much I make. And in a lot of places, you know, a dollar a day or, a, I mean, a dollar a month is too expensive. So this is a, this is a huge challenge uh, that, uh, because there's this vast range of uh, income levels and affordability capabilities that people have. So this is, this is important. Why it's so uh relevant to us uh, in our work with libraries is that libraries are almost built to address affordability because the, the, the principle of the library, you know, you pool community resources and you acquire, uh, you, you acquire information, technologies, books, internet, whatever, and then you share it, not unlimited, but you share it uh, in a reasonable way that allow people to participate in uh, that. And so that, and you know, for 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 nothing. I mean, for free or for no fee. That doesn't mean that it's free to do, but the the costs are spread across the whole community, or a state, or a province, or however it's set up. And then the usability, which we just toss out here with this term, is uh, probably the most complex, uh, socially complex of the of the three barriers. Uh, a lot of people can just figure something out. You don't even have to tell them what it is. They'll just start playing with it. They'll figure it out. But most people, they need guidance. They need help. They need training. They need support. They need, of course, the, 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 the tools, the technology to actually use the internet. So all of these we've just bundled up into one term here, usability. Uh, but it's the skills, of course, and, and uh, relevant content. A lot of places in the world use uh, a language that's not even the official language of the country. Uh, they, there's so many dialects that people uh, uh, use instead of whatever the official language might be that is all relevant to what they care about and how they communicate. So we'll, we'll touch on each of these and that's what we're, we're going we're gonna to kind of use this as our agenda uh, as Ryan goes through these and how uh, the Microsoft Airband Initiative is addressing each one, which is amazing. Uh, and so um, this is their stated uh, goal uh, uh, to connect 10 million people, uh, half of those in Africa. I couldn't find the actual quote on when that was, so Ryan will tell us when he, uh, how, how quickly that's going to sort of happen. Uh, Three billion people. Uh, this is this people working on this goal of connecting everybody universal access for uh, at least a decade. It's been a, a top priority of international organizations. And then they've been prompting all kinds of uh, solutions, uh, whether they're governments or nonprofits or corporations for profit, international agencies, everybody is kind of been tr working around with this and it's just been creeping along the internet is just exploding in its uh, development it's uh, um, uh, it's evolution the the emergence of new technologies is just coming at, at ever faster rate and that means that the people that are not yet connected are falling further and further behind even the people that are slightly connected are losing ground to these uh, uh, these uh, advanced markets that are receiving the benefits of all this innovation. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm happy to welcome Ryan Palmer, uh, Global Digital Equity Strategist at Air, uh, Microsoft Airband Initiative. And uh, so uh, Ryan is going to tell us how Microsoft is addressing all of these, trying, trying to, let me just say, he's not, they haven't solved the global divide, but they are making an effort. And as I look around, I haven't seen anybody that has uh, 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 
really tried to tackle this on a scale that Microsoft seems to, but I'm really interested to see how they're doing. And so we'll, we'll go one by one with these and then we'll, uh, we'll open up for some questions uh, uh, item by item as, as we go through that. With that, I will welcome Ryan and everybody else. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ryan, welcome, please uh, take us away. Sure. Thanks, Don. And thanks to everyone for uh, for being here today. Really appreciate it. Um, I always enjoy sitting down with you, Don, and talking about these issues. I know you're passionate about it and you've been working on uh, closing the digital divide for 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 many years now, as have I, and, and uh, something I'm I'm also passionate about, like everyone here. So, I appreciate it uh, first and foremost. Uh, so yes, my current role is global digital equity strategist on the Microsoft Airband team. I've been here a little over a year now, uh, but prior to that, just to sort of inform you on how I view these issues and my background, I spent about seven and a half years managing the division at the FCC that oversees the Universal Service Fund programs, including the recent ones like Affordable Connectivity Program and COVID-19 Telehealth Program and others that came along during the pandemic. And I think, I believe I saw Bob on here. He's very familiar and as are you, Don, and many others with our E-rate program, probably most relevant for this group, uh, which provides funding for uh, both the uh, connectivity that you need to get to schools and libraries and then the internal connections that are needed to, to actually make the most of those, of that, of that connectivity of uh, schools and libraries across the United States. And so uh, that's, that's my background. Um, what I thought I'd do here, Don, is give a little bit, you know, follow a, a little background on the Airband mission and our history and sort of how we evolved to our current approach, um, which is, you know, key and central to that is the holistic approach to digital equity, which when we talk about it, we talk about, uh, um, affordability, devices, and skilling, but it fits very nicely in with your availability, affordability, and usability. I mean, they're, they're, we're talking about the same things. Uh, so get into how we approach that um, and then talk about our specific partnership models and partnerships that we've developed, including a double click on the Viasat partnership, which, you know, talk about um, the, the the new things that are coming soon with their Viasat 3 constellation, which is going up and very exciting. Uh, and then a few of our other specific partnerships, and then hopefully just get into a, a bit of a conversation. Uh, if that, does that work for you, Don? Sure. If we can, can we, can we, does that follow the, the kind of three barriers so we can stop and kind of talk about each one or, or is it kind of the whole story? And then we'll, then well, we'll sure. I, I, when we get to the holistic approach, then we sort of break those down and then we can, we can take it any way you want. If that, if that works. Okay, fine. Great. Yeah, Thanks. great. So, so just to start on what, you know, why we're doing this, why Microsoft cares about this, uh, this is all is related to Microsoft's mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. But more specifically for my team at Airband, our mission is to advance high-speed internet access and meaningful connectivity as a fundamental right around the world. Uh, we do this as part of, of Microsoft's broader mission, which I just referred to. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we, we partner with innovative internet service providers, uh, fiber middle mile providers, global satellite companies, energy access providers, nonprofits, government agencies, and others uh, who are focused on closing the digital divide. And uh, we support our partnerships in a number of ways, including technological expertise, policy advocacy, as well as uh, access to funding opportunities, digital skilling resources, importantly, data, uh, and the Airband partnership ecosystem. Uh, we do this because, as you know, Don and everyone here, internet connectivity is no longer a luxury, and it's essential for communication, teleworking, healthcare, education, and other essential services. Um, and so we collaborate across private, public, and nonprofit sectors to build the digital infrastructure required for internet access and adoption, as well as supporting the programs and public policies needed for newly connected communities to really leverage that, the full value of that connectivity. Um, we, we've Airband started. Uh, I'll quickly get to this in 2017. Uh, Microsoft launched this initiative to expand broadband access in rural communities by once again partnering with innovative ISPs that are there on the ground. Uh, we set an initial goal of providing access to 2 million people in unserved rural areas of the United States by July of last year. Um, and, and we, thanks to early success, we expanded that commitment to 3 million people, which, which we uh, met and exceeded, and we aren't slowing down. But we also had our global commitment to connect, uh, to connect, um, let's see, 40 million people outside of the United States by July of last year. 
and do the exceptional work of our partners in, across Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the U.S., uh, our results came in and we've now provided access through these partnerships to more than 51 million people, including 9 million in Africa. Um, and we're doing this by providing the technology, know-how, seed funding, and a proven business model to engage with partners and drive this digital transformation in the communities we reached. Um, and it's just important to note that our model is a bit different, Don, than others. I know you know this, but when we go into a community, we're doing so with partners that are committed to serving those areas for the long haul with a sustainable business model. That's what we're always working towards. We aren't an organization that drops money out of the back of a, of a plane and and, and leaves. We're there with our partners to, to drive sustainable, inclusive economic development. And we have a lot of work to do because unfortunately more than one third of the world's population is still not using the internet. The ITU reported 2.7 billion people remain offline uh, because the connectivity is either not available, not affordable or not accessible. At the same time, you heard me mention our work with energy access providers, 770 million people globally lack access to energy. Um, which of course is a critical requirement for internet infrastructure. Um, so with that, we all must do more, we must do better, which is why during the US Africa Leaders Summit in December, Microsoft Airband made our new commitment to extend internet access to 250 million people in unserved and underserved communities around the world by the end of 2025, uh, including 100 million on the continent of Africa. And so I see your eyes there, Don. I know it's a, it's a big commitment and we're working really hard to, to, uh, to make that happen. And, and I mentioned that the specific commitment of 100 million on the continent of Africa, I just wanna double click on that for one second because the opportunity on the continent is extraordinary. Africa is emerging as one of the most important markets in the world with the fastest growing population projected to go from 1.4 billion to almost 1.7 billion people by 2030. It's the youngest continent in the world the median age under 20 and 60% of the population under the age of 25. So there's a lot of opportunity and, and reason for, uh, for and, and opportunity for growth and, and reasons why we as a whole society across the globe should be supporting Africa and making sure they have the infrastructure needed to connect. And because today only 40% of the African continent is online with nearly 600 million lacking access to electricity just on the continent alone. And so while 250 million reached is a big number. To the point of this conversation, you know, we're not solely focused on deployment of networks and infrastructure. In parallel, we implement a holistic approach to meaningful connectivity that's focused on other barriers to digital inclusion, including affordability, access to dev computing devices to unlock the power of connectivity, and the digital skills and workforce development resources that are needed to use the internet safely and productively. And we do this because we've learned that the implementing this holistic approach is no longer a luxury. Once again, it's not a concept, it's essential because connectivity on its own is not the end goal. It is a means to an end that becomes transformative when communities not only have internet access, which is of course a key piece to, you know, can't have the rest of this without access, but it's, you, you don't just have access, but also you have access to the technology the solutions and the funding that enables meaningful online experiences. And you'll hear this term from me a lot today, digital transformation, because that's what we're looking for in the end. Uh, and our approach uh, is based on our experiences reaching unconnected communities around the world. We learned both through Airband and I would say my experience at the FCC and another other work that I've done that, that what we call the field of dreams approach to rural broadband, that if you build it, they will come. It just doesn't work. Simply deploying networks in rural un or in unserved areas doesn't get the job done because the resulting broadband adoption rates are just far too low, whether it's from a public policy perspective or a business perspective. Um, so our experience has made it clear that we must focus on all aspects of digital equity from day one if we're going to achieve these re adoption rates and the digital transformation that we're looking for, which is why we always advocate for programs and policies that advance access to affordable and accessible internet connectivity, computer devices that meet the, end, the needs of end, end users uh, and digital skilling resources so communities are able to use their connectivity in a meaningful way that improves their lives. And this, once again, all aligns with the barriers to adoption that you noted, Don, uh, and that, that the Gigabit Library Networks previously identified, availability, 
deploying networks that provide access to unserved and underserved communities, affordability. High-speed internet just is worthless if you can't afford it and actually use it, right? You have to be able to afford it. And then usability. How do we take this amazing tool and opportunity and enable digital transformation? Um, and so, so, John, I hope that helps to show our holistic approach that we implement, whether it's in the United States. Um, and and uh, I mentioned we're initially you know, focused on rural areas, which, of course, that's where there are a lot of the access gaps are. But we also focus on urban areas and, and that oftentimes don't have the access that people assume they do, especially in low-income areas. But even if they do, still need the other resource. They need to make sure it's affordable, that they have the devices to use it, and that they have resources to get the skilling and digital relevance, you know, get over that hump so they really are able to make the most of the connectivity. And so, Dom, would you like to, to double click on any of those, uh, any of that, or I could keep going, but I'd, I'd love to well, stop. And <laughs> it's a lot, Ryan. I mean, uh, it, just it's remarkable. <laughs> oh, I know, you're just getting started. It's a remarkable uh, uh, comprehensive statement you've made about, you know, tackling all of this. Uh, like I said earlier, I, I can't think of anybody that has really tried that on any kind of scale that that matches Microsoft, which, of course, we have a we have a soft spot for Microsoft, for the founder of Microsoft, who uh, had an opportunity to become the uh, the Carnegie of our time uh, supporting libraries and uh, uh, the Gates Foundation, of course, what I'm mm -hmm. talking about funding uh, libraries uh, around the world for 10 years or so before they moved off to diseases. I, I thought, personally, I thought this was a perfectly wrong time to abandon libraries because they're so central to communities and, and really everything you're talking about. Uh, uh, they provide a nexus for all of these issues where it all comes together. It doesn't solve every issue for everybody everywhere, but it it addresses all of the issues for everybody at a place, one place. Um, we we tend to be U.S. concentrated just because you know GLN is based in the U.S. and and uh, a lot of the programs you talked about from uh, at the FCC are are relevant in the U.S. Um, but we're not the the this initiative. We have participation from all over the place. We're doing projects in Africa, as a matter of fact, and looking to do more. Uh, and so this is this is open. This is a global phenomena, and uh, and we, we're we're trying to address that uh, to the extent that we can. Our little corner of this conversation, uh, the the connectivity uh, part of that to to libraries. It's it's also to the facility as we say, but also through the facility, the, the opportunity to leverage new wireless technologies to extend access. It's flowing typically through a, uh, a wire line, a fiber line to a facility, sets up the ability to uh, extend that connectivity using a, a range of wireless technologies and partnerships uh, to extend out into the community. In the U.S., sorry, it's a U.S. statistic that that Roughly one in three adults uh, accesses the internet at a public library. I mean, this is a stunning number. It's you know some 70, 80 million people over 14. It was a, a Pew study a number of years before the pandemic. It's gone down, I think, some. But any number of tens of millions of people using uh, access to the internet at a library is a really big number. <clears throat> Most of them have uh, another source of internet. But for one reason or another, they go there. It's convenient. It's faster. There's somebody that'll help them. Uh, whatever the reason, it's it's secondary. It's just that they do. Many, of course, it's their only source of access, and so that's uh, that's critical uh, in our view that uh, that that exists and that's supported. <clears throat> so this uh, this to and through concept is something that we uh, pioneered roughly ten years ago just about the time we started gigabit libraries and started doing wireless projects. So including technologies we didn't even really talk about in those days, CBRS, uh, which is now exploding as a uh, community scale infrastructure that, that uh, uh, 
anchor institutions are deploying for themselves. School districts are deploying these community-wide networks that connect everybody, all the students in town from their own, basically, cell towers. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, amazing things are happening just with Wi-Fi and, uh, and then educational uh, broadband services spectrum was a, a, a spectrum that was dedicated to these anchor institutions for educational purposes. Years ago, has been clawed back by the FCC. You probably had a hand in that, didn't you, right? I won't <laughs> no, put you on the spot. That. But they put it, they pulled it back to to uh, auction it off because it's really valuable stuff and uh, 2.5 gigahertz, which has a lot of capability for penetrating obstructions and also high capacity. Uh, so let's let's get into the to the to the availability and the and the connectivity part of it. So what what technologies is Airband uh, involved with? I mean, if you can just break those down, I know there's wireline, there's wireless. But how do you, and, and of course, uh, as we mentioned, uh, Viasat, which is a geostationary, currently mm -hmm. geostationary. So if you kind of walk us through the the connectivity technology involved in uh, the Airband's involved in, we, we, that'd be a good place to uh, uh, move through this. Yeah, absolutely, and that's and that's an important thing to touch on. So. We are uh, in all, all of the above technology, you know, the technologies that we leverage to reach communities. What we've learned is that every community has unique needs, unique challenges and solutions. And we're not, you know, to, to focus in on one technology or another really boxes you out and, and, and limits your ability to reach every community. So we, we, rely on our partners and our in our knowledge as well to identify the technologies that are best for the communities that we're trying to reach. So definitely fixed wireless is a huge part of of what we do. But we also leverage fiber, you know, anywhere where it's optimal. Our partners are leveraging fiber as well. We're using, uh, you know, as you mentioned with Viasat, um, we're using our satellite uh, technology now. Uh, we announced, and I can get into more details a little bit, uh, another new partnership with Liquid Intelligent Technologies in Africa. They're the largest fiber operator on the continent of Africa with over 100,000 kilometers. Um, I believe that's around 62,000 miles of, of fiber already deployed on the continent. Um, and so we are, and then we also, as I mentioned before, work with energy access providers. So we're able to set up connectivity hubs in areas that don't have access to electricity as well. So, so we're all of the above. Whatever's going to work for your community, uh, that's what, you know, that and whatever our partners who are the experts on the ground in those communities, what they know is best, we're going to we're going to support that. I should note that historically, when Airband started, you know, about around six years or so ago, um, that we were focused on TV white space technology, which is still a important part of our portfolio, and it's still being used and successfully in some areas. But part of the learning process and evolution that I referred to was was drove us to this this new approach, which is or this you know evolved approach, which is let's bring in all the options, all the tools, so we're not limiting ourselves uh, when we're trying to connect unconnected areas. And so so that's a really important part of it. And if you'd like, I can get in a little bit of the specifics of the Viasat partnership and and that tech and how we're how that's going to be used. I know it's something that was of interest on. Would that would that work? Please, thank you. So yeah, absolutely. I mentioned during the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit we. Uh, we made the announcement, and President Biden also uh, touched on it, about how we're going to be uh, reaching 250 million people around the globe with, with internet coverage by the end of, of 2025. Um, we also, at, at the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit, announced that Airband was, was partnering with Viasat, global communications company Viasat, uh, where for the first time we're going to be using satellite technology to reach those remote areas that previously had few, if any, options for conventional connectivity. Uh, and more specific, you know, to the Viasat partnership, we're going to bring their technology to unserved communities where they can offer satellite middle mile services or to last mile ISP internet service providers providing meaningful connectivity on the ground. They can also offer, you know, uh, the fixed wireless, you know, in home uh, speed, you know, internet service. So there's, there's optionality where, you know, a lot of providers on the ground, especially in really remote unserved areas not only lack access to the last mile connection, but they, they lack access to the middle mile backbone that you need to connect to that you referred to earlier, Don. And this can provide uh, a new new options. And, and when we go into these communities, there's different ways, there's different models that can be leveraged. There can be a, a community Wi-Fi approach 
which would be you know the lowest cost lowest cost option we could cover a community with a single access point or multiple access points on a mesh network but you can also come in and use you know low cost towers using lte spectrum uh, there's some advantage you know all these have different advantages and disadvantages there's high, that's higher cost than what we just talked about um, but it's also able to provide in-home service where the community Wi-Fi is once again more of the, the mesh network. Um, but you can also then go to the to the internet, you know, in-home uh, internet service provider model where you're you know, offering in-home Wi-Fi service via microwave backhaul over single satellite links. And you know that's um, that's also a great option. It's lower cost than the LTE option uh, and doesn't require access to spectrum. Um, but it requires, you know, higher ARPU for users in certain markets, and there's just different pros and cons. So, so there's lots of different ways that we that we can and will uh, leverage this partnership to reach the community, big, to communities we're serving. But it gets back to that point I made before: what's right for that community? Where 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 are we going? And then let's figure out what's the right tech to make sure they can connect. Um, but also a really important. Oh, sorry, Don. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just oh, wanted to also touch on Viasat 3. So in addition to ex exciting that um, there's going to be a significant you know, advancement in these geostationary satellites that Viasat has, they've announced, and you can see on their website, a lot of great information about the Viasat 3 constellation of satellites that are going to be going up uh, in order, and they're going to leverage advanced digital processing and beam forming technologies to enable them to deliver high speed internet services to many users at the same time using small antennas um, and it, you know, it's really gonna, it's, this, is, this is a huge quantum leap here and, and the technology, the satellites are among the most advanced power fat, powerful satellites in the world with each having a total throughput capacity of up to one terabit per second, which is about a hundred times the capacity of the previous satellites that are currently, uh, currently being operated. And they're also equipped with advanced ground-based infrastructure and networking technologies that enables the delivery of high-speed internet services to these remote and un underserved areas. Super interesting. And it sounds like these are smaller, less expensive end-user devices to, to connect these signals. Is that- Yeah, I mean, that absolutely. That's, that, that's, what, that's the goal and that's how, part of the model to be able to make it affordable. You touched on you know, affordability. Yeah. Obviously, this is getting the access there, but if we, it doesn't matter how great the access is and how fast and robust the broadband is, if people can't afford it. So baked into this is what can the community that we're serving afford and how do we come up with an offering that they will be able to afford? I know there's different data out there, whether it's 2% uh, of income, I've heard up to 5% is what what people should be or, or often are able to, to use out of their income to, to pay for connectivity and technology. And so um, obviously in countries where the where the where the income is is quite low, uh, we have to get to a price point that that meets them where they are and finds a way to give people the opportunity really to access and, and empower themselves with this connectivity. Right. Okay. Um, let me uh, let me open this up here for a moment. If, if anybody have uh, questions for Ryan on this uh, on this availability point, these are, there. I mean, there are a bunch of different things he touched on. There's fiber lines, where are they? The the satellites, is innovation from Viasat is uh, pretty impressive sounding. He provided us with uh, a metric for a terabit. Wow, that would, that could, you could support a lot of people with a terabit. Uh, just about any village, I would imagine, of a uh, thousand people uh, or maybe more could uh, mm -hmm. be sustained. Anyone uh, have any questions for uh, Ryan on this first part? Alfredo makes the point about electricity, which of course you uh, uh, you touched on, and it is uh, essential. And that the IEEE uh, in their Smart Village project is 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 an electrification campaign. Uh, Alfredo, you want to say anything about that and how it ties into connectivity? Are you there, Alfredo? You're welcome to uh, speak. I see you on the chat. Maybe you moved on to another. I wonder how many people actually are doing multiple 
you know, uh, Zooms, and they just go, well, that one looks interesting. Uh, that one on mute over there. Uh, okay, Bob uh, Boker, he he uh, he uh, corrects me that uh, Gates was more, well, it wasn't more than 10 years. It was not quite 10 years, 99 to 2007. Uh, we were involved in starting the, uh, the schools, health and libraries broadband coalition in the U.S., and we're able to do that with support from the Gates Foundation in the beginning. Now it's, it's self-sustaining uh, and weighing in on a whole range of connectivity projects uh, and issues and policies for anchor institutions. Uh, when will the Viaset Internet new version be available? When are they projecting, Ryan? Um, Kristen, I know. I know there's. Uh... They're working hard to to, to make pro progress and, and get those satellites up there. And there's a number of factors, but it's it's the process is taking place now. But don't know exactly a date, but it's it's you know shorter term rather than longer term. Well, uh, it hasn't enjoyed the best of reputations as a, a a broadband option in the past. It's been you know the latency issue, the cost has, has been uh, a concern. Data caps have been one of the issues with uh, geostationary uh, broadband. Do you feel like, are you confident they're addressing all of these in a way that would really make a difference in the very places that you're, that you're targeting? Or yeah, I mean, as far as the, yeah, you're right. Obviously, geostationary satellites, there's inherent um, latency um, challenges you know historically i know the technologies continue to get better to, to minimize that as much as possible but they're still geostationary right i mean they're still by nature they're still that far distance that you have to travel with the signal um but you know think they continue to improve and, and and those technologies and like i say when it when it comes to those other issues we're going to craft the, the 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 offering and the business model for the communities we're serving so obviously we're to come in with something that makes it a non-starter or makes it difficult for people to subscribe and utilize it uh, is, is not part of our approach. So we're going to be looking at, you know, all these factors to make sure people are able to connect and use and grow, you know, grow themselves, their lives online. There, there's a lot of strategies of, uh, of front-loading content, caching at the, at the local level. So you're Local network can provide the majority of the applications that people use the majority of the time uh, that uh, don't rely on uh, that kind of interactivity, which can be valuable. I mean, there's initiatives out there on uh, how to operate offline, uh, which is the kind of the biggest challenge, but it's a, it can be effective uh, for people that don't have anything else. Uh, okay, let's let's uh, let's move then to affordability and, and what kind of challenges you run into there that you feel like are being are being addressed by the the, the initiatives you've got going. Sure, I mean I could, I'll start with affordability just because it's being most directly um, impacted here in the United States with the affordable connectivity program. So to touch on that for a second, you know that's in the United States that's a way that we're really leaning in here and you know if, if for those that you aren't familiar that offers um i believe up to 30 dollars per month uh as a for eligible households towards their broadband bill and in many instances many many instances that covers the entire cost of the broadband because uh service providers have stepped up and crafted offerings to 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 reach that number so so people can really uh get online right currently i think it's over 17 million households in the united states who are enrolled in this program and, and it's growing every day. And so uh, it's really having a significant impact on making sure people are able to afford to get online here in the United States. Uh, outside the United States, um, it's, it's more about how do we craft when we're coming in with our partners, how do we make sure that what's being offered, how do, they, how do our partners make sure what they're going to you know, uh, bring to the community is affordable. So once again, we th that would be something we look at ahead of time. We're not gonna, uh, you, could, you could imagine we wouldn't go in with our partners to a community and not think about affordability before we deploy networks. And then we get in there and realize that, hey, nobody can afford what we're offering. And that was, you know, a waste of time. So it's, it, you know, the, the making sure that people in the communities that we're serving and, and families can afford the service is essential when, plan, when doing the business plans from day one. So that's always a factor that's going to be, be part of the equation. 
Well, that's in any reasonable business model, yeah. isn't it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, it's not groundbreaking. So, uh, so uh, Microsoft is, uh, you know, involved in a lot of issues, and and one of the one of the things that seemed like it could make a big difference is uh, national uh, policy, as you have firsthand experience with the FCC. Uh, every country has its own regulator, and they set a lot of terms. One of the questions has been. Uh, why hasn't universal service been more widely implemented? It's an easy concept to understand. Uh, and actually, it's a pretty easy uh, thing to fund. Uh, and as to say, collect the funds as, a, you know, just tap into the services and extract a percentage fee. And then you build up a pot of money, which has been done. The difficulty is in spending it effectively. And so that seems to be the, the barrier to that is that, is that a policy domain? And uh, are there other policy domains that Microsoft's involved in at the national level around the world? So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, the universal service funds, you know, the idea of setting one up and establishing it and using it to really drive access and adoption um, is something that I, you know, I work on all the time. It is, it is challenging outside of the United States. Some countries are do, outside of the U.S. are doing it and having a lot of success. There's also been historical problems that I, you know, in, in countries, some have, have tried to do it and, like I said, had trouble um, paying, you know, when it came time to like to, to pay up, oftentimes the money wasn't there because of reasons outside of my purview. So you've had, you know, carriers in some countries that are really hesitant to, even if there's new USF programs coming along, to participate because, Either they or other companies have been burned in the past by promises from previous administrations of, you know, and other times that didn't follow through and, and it really cost companies, you know, money. And sometimes I've heard of, of, of some that had to close, you know, close up shop because they're overly reliant on USF funds that never, never uh, appeared. And so there's challenges with just poorly run, I would say, is my, my, my view, uh, programs in the past that, that, uh, concern people and, and make them and companies wary of, of participating. Also, some countries don't, you know, they may have a universal service fund, but it's it's compared to what we've seen here in the United States, it's it's far smaller. And so the opportunities are less um, for these companies. And so they often just make a business decision that maybe is too burdensome and regulatory burden is too high and and the and the requirements to participate aren't worth what they would be able to um, receive from the program. And then many countries at times also just have, it's a challenge to collect those funds because there's so many other needs and, and there's so much, you know, people and there's uh, often the economies are on hard times. So they're not able to, to even collect enough to, to make it meaningful. So there's been challenges around the world, but, you know, I just had a conversation last Friday with the administration in Kenya. This, the newest administration there is really gung ho about, about supporting what they're calling the digital super highway and providing universal service funds to uh, providers who are going to be reaching unserved areas and, and reach a lot of the communities in rural parts of Kenya that just don't have access. And so there are good things happening out there um, in the universal service context around the world. And we're, and we, we, we lean in where appropriate because it definitely is a, as we've seen is a great mechanism to really close the digital divide um, if you do it right. But it's, it's uh it's each country is a unique, uh, unique paradigm, and, and chat, there's different challenges and, and opportunities as well. Exactly, exactly. So, is that uh, is that a strategy? Is is engaging the national government uh, a kind of a first step when you go into a country to uh, see how receptive the national government is to your involvement in their in their markets and partnering with their companies and nonprofits, so forth. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you're hitting on a good point. Obviously, we don't want to go in anywhere unless we know, you know, we want to make sure that there's supportive, you know, government, local, federal that are going to, you know, support our efforts. And so that's part of the process. Although the good thing is now Airbnb's been around for a while, starting to be more of a known commodity. So it's, we're also having the opposite happen where you might, you know, have outreach from government regulators or policymakers saying, Hey, how can we work together? How can we bring Airband to our community? You know, how can we partner together to do more? Which is really, for me, exciting because it's you know the the, the hard work that the team has put in far before I joined um, is really paying off with that you know global reputation 
And I think that comes with the success of our partners. You know, our partners are out there doing work. And when we can show, tell the stories and show the impact that they're driving, uh, you know, governments, others get FOMO, quite frankly. And they're, they're like, how can we be a part of this? And uh, so we're, we're in that world now, too. So it, once again, every engagement's unique, but it's really uh, it's been fun for me to see that reaction from, from many, many countries. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's uh, let's get to usability here with the, our last part of the uh, segment here, and and that includes uh, devices and uh, technology, you know, end user technology uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, James Walker is prompting here with uh, thoughts about device computer strategy. You know, where do Microsoft products fit into these? solutions. And on that point, you're absolutely right about uh, leading with technology. We were there at the beginning of TV white space as well. And we learned, relearned the lesson that you cannot lead with uh, a solution. You cannot lead with the technology uh, because you'll be kind of shoehorning it into places where it just doesn't really work, but you have to go in and design from the, from the ground up, which you, a point you made clear. Uh, but can you address this, uh, uh, James's uh, message there? Well, I can't Computer. to a certain extent, and I, I should note, even I work at Microsoft, I'm an attorney and an English major, so we get too technical and I'm uh, getting over my head. But 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 definitely, the, I, I would say from my experience, is the device challenge um, is, you know, solving for, for lack of access to devices has been a and continues to be a significant challenge. It's, it's not easy. You know, in the United States, um, we rely on device refurbishers as we partner with and, and use our device refurbishers like uh, PCs for people, or there, there's so many good ones out there, human IT and others who are have, you know, built, built relationships with, let's say, Fortune 500 companies and others who every so often bring their de old devices there and they're cleaned and, and scrubbed to make sure there's no sensitive information. And then they're, they're, they're back out in the communities that they serve. And I've seen, you know, went to Cleveland to see pieces for people in their operation, and it's just extremely impressive. And, and the good news is, once again, it's United States centric, but the good news in the U.S. is that uh, the Congress recently passed the Chips and Science, or sorry, the COVES Act, different act, uh, which is computers for veterans and students. And it's going to take the computers from the United States government and refer and allow device refurbishers to have access to them to do the same process, clean them up, make sure they're ready to go, and then put them out there in the ecosystem for students and veterans to use. And that, that's a huge, huge change and opportunity and a great, a great piece of legislation passed by Congress just last year. And so in the U.S., we're continuing to it's still a big barrier to adoption and, and to and to digital transformation but we're making progress overseas it's once again it's unique to the uh to the to the communities we're in africa is a while we're continuing to drive in-home broadband you know uh the mobile it, it's a mobile country everyone is online with their with their mobile um, devices and so we have a partner like m copa who's over there working on uh, getting devices affordable devices into the hands of people that can use them and and not just affordable but they put you know, uh, software or not. So they put technology on on the phones that allow people to to pay their energy bill or to to do lots of you know important functions um, to make their lives easier. And and so we're looking at all the all different options. And then you can imagine in a community where there's no electricity, oftentimes our connectivity hub they're they're not going to have devices. So we you know have devices there for people to use. Or we have some partners who have done a, a program where they loan out tablets and, and other devices so people can can use them. So there's different approaches for different communities, um, but it is and it continues to be a challenge and really a, a one that's um, we got to we have to continue to lean into to figure out what the right solution is, because it's uh, it's not it's, it's not a, it's not an easy path, but it's something that we're making. Uh, problems. <laughs> what an easy. understatement. Uh, Okay, well let's let's uh, let's let's finish uh, with uh, the skills development, the usability part. That you know, people have to understand that you know what's relevant about this, what they could do with it, how they could how it could be valuable to them. That they would even come up with uh, you know a dollar a month if they had it. To, uh, so what's 
you use the term skilling, uh, a new a new verb, I think, that's emerged from skills. Uh, what, what you have a you have a pretty involved program uh, related to developing skills. Well, yes, I mean skills is you know once again we can do all this other work, but if people aren't comfortable to get online, they don't have the skills and know how to navigate. It's it's gonna you know it's just not gonna not gonna be successful. So skilling is an important piece of of what we do. Although you know there's different ways to do it. Once again, you know we have um, you know you have we have resources that we that all of our partners have access to and and like LinkedIn Learning uh, resources and different digital skilling resources which are great. But well, I'll say, what I will say is what we've learned. Once again, another learning here is that we can drive it, our partners can drive it, but when you're going to have the most success having people access those resources and really use them, it's when you're going in through someone in the local community, someone who's trusted, who's on the ground, who's been there. So if it's a digital navigator program or some sort of a, a local community organization that's, that's around, that's when oftentimes when communities embrace these resources because they're, they're coming to them from someone they trust, someone that they they value and they know isn't going to steer them wrong. So our partners bring all these resources, but really when we have the most success, it's when, and, and oftentimes they're on our, the websites for our internet service providers and they're out there and they're being used. But where you're really driving impact with skilling is when you're leaning on those local people in the community who already have, you know, who know the people that they're going to be working with and training. And once again, you meet meet them where they are. And so we continue to push and support more, uh, more funding and more resources to go to these community-based organizations. Good news is, once again, here in the United States, finally things are starting to, to change. And for instance, in the, in the BEAD program and the Digital Equity Act, there are requirements that these states and these funds, these different programs reach out and work closely with uh, the communities are going to be reaching and identify some of these partners on the ground who can, who can be there to evangelize and, and push the digital skilling resources out there so people uh, are able to really use them and transform their lives. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I guess a final question for you here is uh, we may run over a minute or two because we started a minute or two late, but um, when you're counting these impressive numbers this quarter of a billion people you've targeted uh so what constitutes uh being online is that a phone or is that a uh, i mean do you do you define meaningful access in any way we we've, we've talked about the difference between what you can do on a phone which is a lot right it's just you talk to people you can go anywhere with it you know it's it's an essential tool but trying to write a, a paper on a phone or uh, uh, do uh, do any kind of, you know, the applications, you know, try to do a spreadsheet on a phone, you're going to have, you know, so what, when, how do you count your, uh, how do you count your new users by, by what? If you just you're handing out, somebody handing out phones and with uh, prepaid subscriptions and they're part of your 250 million? That's not part of our model, no, Don, but, but I mean, to your point, so what I what I would say in the end, I want to drive. We want to drive meaningful connectivity, which often, you know, more often than not, to me, that's that's in home, fixed, you know, broadband. You can do all the things you're talking about. Where you can connect with a computer. You can you can do you know advanced uh, functions, and you can work on documents and work from home and do all the do all those things. However, when in some communities, once again, if you don't have access to electricity. Um, you're, you know, where we start is, is we have a different starting point. So, so you know, we're, we're, we want to push, you know, in the end, that 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 fixed service in the home that's robust is what, you know, what is most meaningful for people, but we have to start somewhere. So some communities, it's different, uh, you know, and, and just depends on on where we're going and, and what they need. But so it, it's 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 nuanced. Yeah. OK. All right. Well, it's impressive, uh, and you know, I, I, it's T minus twenty months here. Uh, so, just in the time we started talking about doing this thing, you, you, if you divide that two hundred fifty million by 
by 24 months, you know, it's like 10 million people a month. They, you know, you're probably not up to that rate yet, but you're expecting to accelerate the adoption levels to, as you get closer to the end goal. It's impressive. We're going to be tracking. We're going to be calling you out on this, Ryan, Good. Uh, as uh, as uh, it, it goes on, because you've put yourself out there. I'm saying you, Microsoft, you put yourself out there with a really ambitious goal and uh, it, it's inspiring. And I have to, uh, I have, we have to give you uh, a, a major kudo for, for taking on something like this. We understand that it's, you know, it's in your interest to have more people connected. That's, that's fine. You know, a lot of them are, end up being your customers uh, and that's, that's reasonable, but uh, uh, it's still, it's still impressive. So uh, we're at and over the hour. Uh, I want to thank you very much for this enlightening hour. We could, we could have spent an hour on each one of these topics easily, easily. And we, we ended up, you know, kind of just touching on them, but we've opened the door to a lot more investigation and thought. And thank you very much, Ryan, for uh, taking the time with us today. We appreciate it. We hope you come back. I would love to, and I appreciate you. And I'm going to put my um, email in the chat here. I know James and Colleen had reached out, and I'll, so we can try to touch base uh, and further some of this okay, conversation. Right. Is, there, is there a particular... Uh, site that you i mean do people just search airband and they'll find everything they need yeah if you go into to bing or anything else if you search airband um <laughs> it'll it'll come up and take you there and one thing i would encourage you if you're if you're a nerd like me really into this stuff there is a link to our digital equity data dashboard which is what was get us specific but it allows you to get down to the census track level with lots of different digital equity data and try to understand better what the, what the gaps are, equity gaps are in the communities. And it's just it's fun, it's on Power BI. It's sort of like an election night map where you see the different colors and things. And I enjoy uh, learning from it and it might be something that's of interest to this group. So I know you all are very, uh, very interested in these issues, but there's also a lot of other good info on there as well. You mentioned Bing, so I've got to uh, follow up with, are you getting questions about, uh, 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 about uh, uh, chat GBT uh, being incorporated into Bing search and how that's part of your your solution mix. Yeah, I mean, we've definitely talked to our partners about that and how they can leverage uh, leverage uh, AI to to improve their processes and 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 things. And we've had a lot of excellent feedback from our partners. So it's something we're we're absolutely exploring with them. Give us an example, can you? We're still working on it, so I, well, it's, we look forward to having some proof points maybe during our next conversation, Don. But uh, All right. but, but there's but we're yeah you know, definitely uh, looking forward to having those stories to tell. Well, uh, good luck, Ryan, and uh, we'll we'll look forward to uh, following up on it. So, with that, I want to thank everybody, and uh, we will close the session now. Uh, we tend to hang around for a few minutes for just kind of loose talk, we say. But uh, for the recording, we'll close that now. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everybody.